Saraya and I had been married for 15 years when the call came from Pakistan. Rahim Khan was ill. He wanted me to go and see him. I drove to Golden Gate Park where dozens of miniature boats sailed. I glanced up and saw a pair of kites floating high above the trees. I thought about the comment Rahim Khan had made before hanging up. Come, there is a way to be good again. My suspicions had been right all those years. He knew about Asif, the kite, the wristwatch. He'd always known. As the taxi passed Peshawar University, we entered an area the driver referred to as Afghan town. I saw sweet shops, carpet sellers, and tiny restaurants with maps of Afghanistan painted on their windows, interlaced with backstreet aid agencies. I thought about the last time I saw Rahim Khan. He'd come to say goodbye the night Baba and I fled from Kabul. I remember them embracing, crying softly. When we arrived in America, they kept in touch by phone. The last time I'd spoken to Rahim Khan was shortly after Baba's death. The driver pulled up by a narrow building. I walked up to the second floor and down a dim hallway. A thing made of skin and bones pretending to be Rahim Khan opened the apartment door. We sat on a wispy mattress and I poured tea from a small cup of samovar. The conversation inevitably turned to the Taliban. Is it as bad as I hear? Worse. They don't let you be human. Rahim Khan had moved into Baba's house when we left. Later, when the Northern Alliance took over, different factions claimed different parts of Kabul. You practically needed a visa to go from one neighborhood to the other. So we just stayed put. People prayed the next rocket wouldn't hit their house. When the Taliban rolled in and kicked the alliance out, I actually danced on the street. Hope's a strange thing. A violent coughing fit gripped Rahim Khan and rocked his gaunt body. How are you? I asked. Dying, actually. He blotted his brow from one wasted temple to the other. I knew he read the next question on my face. Not long. Let me take you home with me. I can find a good doctor. They're coming up with new treatments all the time. I was rambling and I knew it. But it was better than crying. Rahim Khan chuckled. <laughs> I see America has infused you with the optimism that made her so great. Look, I'm being pragmatic. I've seen several good doctors and they're all given the same answer. There is such a thing as God's will. There was another reason I asked you to come. You know all those years I lived in your father's house? I wasn't alone. Hassan lived there with me. Hassan, the thorny old barbs of guilt bore into me. I thought of writing and telling you, but I wasn't sure you wanted to know. Was I wrong? I don't know. I'm going to ask something of you. But before I do, I want to tell you about Hassan. I didn't want to let your father's house go to rot, Amir Jan. It had meant so much to him. So one day, I drove to the village where Ali and Hassan moved, after Ali dismissed himself from the house. I found Hassan living in the only house in the village that had a walled garden. I had to make him stop kissing my hands when he saw me. He had grown so tall. But other than that, he had those same green eyes, that scar on his lip, <laughs> that smile. You would have recognized him, Amir. I'm sure of it. We went inside and met his wife, Farzana. Hassan told me that Ali and his cousin had been killed by a landmine two years before. A landmine. Is there a more Afghan way of dying? Farzana made us a meal, and I told Hassan about the house, and how I couldn't care for it by myself anymore. I asked him to move to Kabul with me. At first, he wanted to stay. He and Farzana, 
had made a life for themselves in the village. He asked about you, and I told him you were in America. He wanted to know had you married? Did you have children? Did you still fly kites? Were you happy? He learned to write, and he asked if he wrote you a letter, would I pass it on to you? He wept like a child when he heard about your father. He and Farzana insisted that I spend the night there. All night I could hear them whispering and Hassan sobbing. And in the morning he told me that he decided to move to Kabul with me. When I asked if he was sure, he said, Ohosa was like my second father. When we got back to Kabul, Hassan refused to move into the house. He said it was a matter of respect. He and Farzana moved into the hut in the backyard. I pleaded with them to use the guest bedroom, but he wouldn't. They did all the cooking, all the cleaning. Hassan tended the flowers in the garden, painted the walls. It was as if he was preparing the house for someone's return. In the winter of 1990, they had a son, and they called him Sorab, after Hassan's favorite hero from the Shanama. Do you remember you used to read it to him? He was a beautiful little boy, with the same sweet temperament as his father. Hassan taught Sorab how to shoot the slingshot, and by the time he was eight, he was deadly with the thing. He also taught him to read and write. His son wasn't going to grow up illiterate like he had. I grew very attached to that little boy. He reminded me of you. You remember I told you? How we all celebrated when the Taliban rolled in? Well, that night when I got home, I found Hassan in the kitchen listening to the radio. God help the Hazaras now, Rahim Khan, he said. But the war is over, I said. There's going to be peace. A few weeks later, the Taliban banned kite fighting. Two years later, they massacred the Hazaras in Mazia Sharif. Rahim Khan fished an envelope from his jacket and handed it to me. Inside was a photograph and a folded letter. A tall man wearing a white turban stood with a little boy in front of a set of wrought iron gates. He exuded a sense of self-assuredness. His arms comfortably crossed on his chest. His smiling face tilted towards the sun. Rahim Khan was right. I'd have known him anywhere. The little boy stood barefoot his head resting against his father's hip. He too was grinning. I unfolded the letter. In the name of Allah, the most beneficent, the most merciful, Amir Aha, with my deepest respects, Farzana Jan, Sohrab, and I pray that this letter finds you in good health. I have told much about you to Farzana and Sohrab, about us growing up together. They laugh at the stories of the mischief we used to cause. Alas, the Afghanistan of our youth is long dead. In Kabul, fear is everywhere, and you cannot escape the killing. I wish you could see Sorab. He's a good boy. The two of us often walk up to the cemetery on the hill. We sit under the shade of our pomegranate tree, and I read him the Shanama. I have been dreaming a lot lately, Amir. I dream that my son will grow up to be a free person, and that flowers will bloom in the streets of Kabul again, and kites will fly in the sky. And I dream that someday you will return to the land of our childhood. If you do, you'll find a faithful friend waiting for you. May Allah be with you always. Hassan. Rahim Khan said, that letter was written six months ago, before I came to Peshawar. A month after I arrived, I got a call. Soon after I'd left Kabul, a rumor spread that a Hazara family was living alone in the big house. A pair of Talib officials came to investigate and interrogate Hassan. When he explained he was looking after the house for me, they accused him of lying and ordered him out. Hassan protested. So they took him out on the street. They made him kneel. They shot him in the back of the head. 
من فرزانه از گریمد دشاتو تو What did they do with Sohrab? I asked I heard he's in an orphanage Rahim Khan paused I already knew what he was going to say I want you to bring Sohrab here I know an American couple Thomas and Betty Codwell They run a small charity to help house and feed Afghan children who'd lost their parents. They're good people. They've already told me Sohrab would be welcome. Rahim Khan, I can't go to Kabul. It's too dangerous. I have a wife in America. A home. Sohrab is a gifted little boy. We can give him a new life here, new hope. Why me? I think we both know why it has to be you, don't we? I dropped my eyes. Rahim Khan leant back against the wall. There is something else you should know. Before Ali married Hassan's mother, he was married to a Hazara woman who left him childless after three years. Ali was sterile. He had Hassan? No, he didn't. Then who? I think you know who. I felt like a man sliding down a steep cliff. Did Hassan know? Rahim Khan shook his head. You bastards! How could you hide this from me? Suddenly it all made sense. The signs had been there all along. Baba hiring Dr. Kamar to fix Hassan's hair lip. Never missing Hassan's birthday. And the day I'd asked if he'd consider getting new servants. Hassan stays right here with us, he'd said. This is his home and we're his family. Then I saw Baba on the day of my graduation. I wish Hassan had been with us today. How could he have lied to me all those years? To Hassan? When I was little, hadn't he sat me on his lap and said, There is only one sin. And that's theft. When you tell a lie, you steal someone's right to the truth. And now, 15 years after I'd buried him, I was learning that Baba had been a thief of the worst kind because the things he'd stolen had been sacred. From me, the right to know I had a brother. From Hassan, his identity. And from Ali, his honor. Then it occurred to me, that Baba and I were more alike than I'd realized. We'd both betrayed the people who would have given their lives for us. And with that came the realization that Rahim Khan had summoned me here to atone not just for my sins, but for Baba's too. There is a way to be good again, he said. A way to end the cycle. With a little boy. An orphan. Hassan's son, somewhere in Kabul. The drive through the tribal lands of the Khyber Pass was just as I remembered it when Baba and I had driven through back in 1974. The driver was a sullen man called Farid. Rahim Khan had warned me not to expect a warm welcome from those who stayed in Afghanistan and fought the wars. Farid was dressed much as I was, a rough woven woolen blanket wrapped over a grey piran tumban. I was also wearing a false beard, provided by a man Rahim Khan knew who specialized in weaving them for journalists. Rahim Khan had wanted me to stay in Pashwa to plan more thoroughly but I knew I had to leave as soon as possible. I was afraid the appeal of my life in America would draw me back, that I'd let it tempt me away from this one last chance of redemption. As for Soraya, telling her I was going back to Afghanistan just wasn't an option. We'd crossed the border, and the signs of poverty were everywhere. I feel like a tourist in my own country, I said. You still think of this place as your country? scoffed Farid. After 20 years of living in America? I think a part of me always will, 
I grew up here. He snorted. Let me imagine, Aha Saab. You probably live in a big three-story house with a nice backyard that your gardener filled with flowers and fruit trees. All gated, of course. You had servants, probably Hazaras. And I bet my first son's eyes, this is the first time you worn a pakol. He pointed to an old man dressed in rags. That's the real Afghanistan, Oha Saib. You've always been a tourist here. You just didn't know it. What brings you back to Afghanistan anyway? Selling land? Selling a house? Before you run back to America and spend the money on family vacation in Mexico? I'm going to Kabul to find a boy. I fished the photo of Sorab and Hassan out of my pocket. What does this Hazara mean to you? His father meant a lot to me. He's dead now. Farid blinked. He was a friend of yours? My instinct was to say yes, but there'd been enough lies already. He was my half-brother, my illegitimate half-brother. I want to take his son back to Peshwa. There are people there who take care of him. Farid rested his hand on my shoulder. You are an honorable man, Amir Ah, a true Afghan. I cringed inside. As we neared the city, he said, Kabul isn't the way you remember it. So I hear. He gave me a look that said hearing isn't the same as seeing, and he was right. Because when Kabul finally did unroll before us, I was certain, absolutely certain, that he'd taken a wrong turning somewhere. Rubble and beggars, everywhere I looked, that was what I saw. I remember the beggars in the old days, but these were children, some no older than five or six. As I looked at them in their mother's laps, it slowly dawned on me that the wars had made fathers a rare commodity in Afghanistan. The buildings that hadn't been entirely obliterated to rubble barely stood. Where are the trees? I asked. Snipers you to hide in them. A sadness came over me. Returning to Kabul was like running into an old, forgotten friend and seeing that life hadn't been good to him. Can you pull over? I asked. We walked down the street a while. Remember what the street smelled like in the old days? Farid smiled. Lamb kebab. The only people who get to eat lamb now are the Taliban. Speaking of which, Baird Patrol. A truck was approaching us, and that was the first time I saw the Taliban. I'd seen them on TV, in newspapers. But here I was, less than 50 feet away from them, telling myself that the sudden taste in my mouth was an unadulterated naked fear. Here they came, in all their glory. The red pickup idled past us. A handful of stern-faced young men sat on their haunches in the cab. Kalashnikovs slung on their shoulders. They all wore beards and black turbans. One of them twirled a whip in his hand. His roaming eyes fell on me, held my gaze. I'd never felt so naked in my entire life. Then the Talib spat tobacco-stained spittle and looked away. I found I could breathe again. What's the matter with you? Farid hissed. Don't ever stare at them. Do you understand me? Never! We found the orphanage in the northern part of Kathaseth. A thin man with tiny eyes like black peas opened the door and glanced from me to Farid. Salam alaikum. I showed him my photograph. We're searching for this boy. Sorry, I never seen him. You barely looked at the picture, my friend, Farid said. The man studied the picture, handed it back. Sorry, now if you'll permit me, I have work to do. He closed the door. I rapped with my knuckles. Aha, 
Please, we do not mean him any harm. Please, go away, came the voice. Farid stepped up to the door. Friend, we are not with the Taliban. The man who is with me wants to take this boy to a safe place. I come from Peshawar, I said. I knew Sorab's father. His name was Hassan. The boy knows how to read and write, and he's good with a slingshot. There's hope for him, a way out. I'm his half-uncle. A moment passed, then a key rattled in the lock. The man's narrow face reappeared in the crack. You were wrong about one thing. He is great with a slingshot, tucks it in the waist of his trouser everywhere he goes. He invited us into his orphanage. There's very little shelter here. Almost no food, no clothes, no clean water. What I have in ample supply is children who've lost their childhood. But the tragedy is that these are the lucky ones. We are filled beyond capacity, and every day I turn away mothers who bring their children. You say there is hope for Surab. I pray you don't lie, Oha. But you may well be too late. What do you mean? I asked. What I have to tell you is not pleasant. Not to mention that it may be very dangerous. There is a Talib official. He visits every month or two. He brings cash with him. The man's shifty eyes fell on me, rolled away. Usually he'll take a girl, but not always. And you allow this? Farid growled from behind me. What choice do I have? You're the director. There's nothing I can do to stop it. I haven't been paid in over six months. Everything I ever owned I sold to run this godforsaken place. You think I don't have family in Pakistan? I could have run like everyone else, but I didn't. I stayed for the sake of the children. If I deny him one, he takes ten. So I let him take one and leave the judging to Allah. I swallow my pride and take his filthy, dirty money. Then I go to the bazaar and buy food for the children. Farid dropped his eyes. How do we find him? I asked. Go to the Garzi Stadium tomorrow. You see him at half time. He'll be the one wearing sunglasses. A bustling crowd thronged the entrance tunnel of the stadium. We found a spot to sit just left of midfield. I remembered how green the playing field had been in the 70s, when Baba used to bring me to soccer games here. Now the pitch was a mess. There were craters everywhere, most notably a pair of deep holes in the ground behind the south end goalposts. And there was no grass. When the two teams finally took to the field, it was difficult to follow the ball for the cloud of dust. They brought them out shortly after the half-time whistle. A pair of dusty red pickup trucks rode into the stadium. The crowd rose to its feet. A woman in a green burqa sat in the cab of one truck, a blindfolded man in the other. Next to me, Farid mumbled a prayer under his breath. A third truck met them at the end of the field. It was loaded with something in the back. I suddenly understood the purpose of those two holes behind the goalposts. Do you want to stay? Farid asked. I'd never in my life wanted to be away from a place so badly. We have to stay. When they'd forced the couple into the chest-deep holes, a chubby white-bearded cleric recited a prayer from the Quran into a microphone. I remembered something Baba had said to me years earlier. Piss on the beards of all those self-righteous monkeys. They do nothing but thumb their rosaries and recite a book written in a tongue they do not even understand. God help us all if Afghanistan ever falls into their hands. When the prayer was done, the cleric cleared his throat. Brothers and sisters, we are here today to carry out Sariah. Every sinner must be punished in a manner befitting his sin. And what manner of punishment, brother and sister, befits 
the adulterer? How shall we answer those who throw stones at the windows of God's house? We shall throw stones back. Next to me, Farid was shaking his head. And they call themselves Muslims. A tall man in white stepped out of the third truck. When he faced our section of the crowd, I saw he was wearing dark round sunglasses, like the ones John Lennon wore. That must be our man, Farid said. The tall Talib walked to the pile of stones they'd unloaded from the truck. He picked up a rock, and looking absurdly like a baseball pitcher on the mound, he hurled the stone at the blindfolded man. The woman screamed. I closed my eyes. The spectators, oh, accompanied each flinging of the stone. I don't know how much longer I sat with my face in my hands. I know that I only reopened my eyes when I heard people around me ask, Mort, is he dead? When the blooded corpses have been unceremoniously tossed into the backs of the red pickups, a few men with shovels hurriedly fill the holes. A few minutes later, the teams took the field. The second half was underway. After the game, the swiftness with which the appointment was set up surprised me. All Farid had to do was tell one of the Talib that we had personal business to discuss with the Talib in the white. He nodded and shouted something to a man on the field who ran to the goalpost where the Talib in the sunglasses stood. I saw him look up. He nodded, and the messenger brought word back. The meeting was set. Three o'clock. Farid parked the Land Cruiser in the driveway of a big house. I guess I wait here for you. Don't worry, I'll be back, I said. Not at all sure that I would be. Armed men frisked me and then led me upstairs to a room with twin green sofas and a big screen TV. The older of the men motioned to the sofa with the barrel of his weapon. Then they left. I knew what I'd managed to get myself into was insanity. I was in a holding cell waiting for a man I'd already seen murder two people that day. The door opened, and the armed man returned with a tall talib in white, still wearing his dark John Lennon glasses. He took a seat across from me, and for a long time just sat, watching me, one hand drumming the upholstery. I saw a splotch of dry blood on his left sleeve. Periodically, his free hand floated up, and his thick fingers battered at something in the air. As his sleeve retracted, I saw marks on his forearm. I'd seen those tracks on homeless people in grimy alleys in San Francisco. Finally, he said, You can do away with that now, you know? He motioned to one of his men, and suddenly my cheeks were stained as the god tossed my false beard up and down in his hand. The Talib smiled. One of the better ones I have seen. So, inshallah, you enjoyed the show today? Public justice is the greatest kind of show. Drama, suspense, and the best of all, education, en masse. You should have been with me in mazar e sharif Sorry? I said. Door to door we went, calling for the men and the boys. We'd shoot them right there in front of their families. Let them see. Let them remember where they belong. You don't know the meaning of the word liberating until you've done that. Let the bullets fly, free of guilt and remorse, knowing you are doing God's work. It's breathtaking. I felt sick. I'm looking for a boy. <laughs> Isn't everyone? I understand he's here with you. His name is Sorab. Answer me something. Why aren't you here with your Muslim brothers, serving your country, 
There are those who believe that abandoning your homeland when it needs you most is treason. I could have you shot. Does that frighten you? I'm only here for the boy. Does that frighten you? Yes. He leaned back on the sofa. I thought about Soraya. It calmed me. I remembered our wedding day. The two of us dancing to an old Afghan song, everyone clapping. The Talib was saying something. Would you like to see my boy? Yes. The guard left the room. I heard him say something in Pashto. Then footfalls and the jingle of bells with each step. The door opened and the guard walked in carrying Asteria on his shoulder. Behind him, a boy dressed in a loose sapphire blue Perhan Tamban. He had his father's round face, the face of my childhood. His head was shaved, his eyes darkened with mascara, and his cheeks glowed with an unnatural red. His eyes fell on me. Then he looked down at his naked feet. One of the guards pressed a button, and Pashtun music filled the room. The men began to clap. Sorab raised his arms and stood on his tiptoes. He spun gracefully, dipped to his knees, straightened, and spun again. His little hands swiveled at the wrist, his fingers snapped, and his head swung side to side like a pendulum. When the music stopped, the Talib called, Bia, Bia, my boy. Sorab went to him, head down, stood between his thighs. The Talib wrapped his arms round the boy slid his hand down the child's back. One of the guards elbowed the other and sniggered. The Talib told them to leave us alone. Sorab kept stealing furtive glances at me. I've been wondering, the Talib said, what ever happened to old Babalu anyway? The question hit me like a hammer. The childhood taunt I'd heard thrown so often at Hassan's father my legs went cold. The Talib laughed. What did you think? That you'd put on a fake beard and I wouldn't recognize you? I never forget a face. Not ever. He took off his sunglasses and locked his bloodshot blue eyes on mine. Asif. Amirja. But what are you doing here? I asked foolishly. Asif arched an eyebrow. Me? I'm in my element. What? Stoning adulterers, raping children, massacring Hazaras, all in the name of Islam? The words spilled suddenly and unexpectedly. A look of surprise crossed Asif's face. I see. This may turn out to be enjoyable after all. All I want is the boy, I said. Very well. Take him. He shoved Sorab towards me. I took the small, calloused hand. His fingers laced themselves with mine. Then Asif said, Of course. You'll have to earn him. We have some unfinished business, you and I, remember? My entire adult life, whenever I pictured Hassan, it was with his slingshot pointed at Asif's face. Hassan saying they'd have to start calling him one-eyed Asif. I remembered how Asif had backed down, how he'd promised to get us. He had kept that promise with Hassan. Now it was my turn. Asif called the guards. In a moment I'm going to close the door, and he and I are going to finish an old bit of business. When it's done, only one of us will walk out of this room alive. If it's him, he's earned his freedom, and you let him pass. The older guard shifted on his feet. If it's him, you let him pass, screamed Asif. The men nodded. One reached out for Sorab. Leave him. Let him watch, Asif grinned. Lessons are good for boys. As the guards left, Asif reached into the pocket of his jacket. What he fished out didn't surprise me one bit. Brass knuckles. 
I don't know if I gave Asif a good fight. I don't think I did. How could I? It was the first time I'd fought anyone. My memory of the fight is amazingly vivid in stretches. Asif's bloodshot eyes, the sound of my ribs snapping like tree branches, and the end, of course. I don't know at what point I started laughing, but I did. It hurt my jaws, my ribs, and the harder I laughed, the harder Asif fought. What is so funny? He bellowed with each blow. What was so funny was that for the first time since the winter of 1975, I felt at peace. My body was broken. Just how badly, I wouldn't find out till later. But I felt healed. I was on the ground, with Asif straddling my chest. His face a mask of lunacy. When, Bas, a thin voice, Please, no more. I remember the orphanage director saying, He is inseparable from that thing. He tucks it in the waist of his trouser everywhere he goes. Twin trails of black mascara mixed with tears had rolled down his cheeks. His lower lip trembled. His hand was cocked above his shoulder holding the cup of the slingshot. The elastic band was pulled taut. There was a brass ball in the cup. Put it down, Hazara! Hasif hissed. Sorab shook his head. No more, aha, please. Don't hurt him any more. Asif let go of my throat and lunged at Sorab. The slingshot made a thwack and Asif was screaming. He put his hand where his left eye had been. Blood oozed between his fingers. Sorab grabbed my hand, helped me to my feet. Every inch of my battered body wailed with pain. I, I remembered being outside, Farid running towards us. Then I was looking up at the roof of the land cruiser. A tiny hand on my forehead. Faces poked through the haze. They're all wearing green hats. Do I know who I am? Do I hurt anywhere? Days later, I understood. I was in a hospital in Pashwa. The doctor listed the damage. Ruptured spleen, broken ribs, punctured lung, busted eye socket, broken jaw. Farid and Sorab came to visit. Do you know who we are today? Farid asked. Thank you, I said through jaws wired shut. He waved a hand, blushed a little. I turned to Sorab. We were never properly introduced. I'm Amir. He looked at my hand, but he didn't take it. You are the Amir father told me about? Yes. I owe you thanks too, Sorab. You saved my life. He didn't reply. What exactly happened between you and the Talib? Farid asked. Let's just say we both got what we deserved. He nodded. Didn't push it. It occurred to me that somewhere along the way, we'd become friends. You know, the sooner we get away from here, the better. I don't mean the hospital. I mean Peshwar. The Taliban have friends. They will start looking for you. Whilst Farid went to make arrangements, I asked Sorab if he'd like a game of cards. I stole looks at him as he pondered his hand. He was his father in so many ways. What did your father tell you about us? That you were the best friend he ever had. I flipped a card in my fingers. I wasn't such a good friend, I'm afraid. But I think I could be a good friend to you. Would that be all right? I put my hand on his arm gingerly, but he flinched and pushed away his stool. Standing by the window, he pressed his forehead to the glass, fists buried in his armpits. When Farid returned, it was with the news that Rahim Khan had gone and that no one had heard of the American couple he suggested to look after Sorab. They weren't even listed at the American consulate. There was nothing for it. Sorab would have to come with us. I discharged myself from the hospital the next morning and slept through the entire four-hour ride to Islamabad. 
Farid booked us into a small hotel. Sorab sat on one of the beds and drew his knees to his chest while I went back into the street to say goodbye to Farid. When I returned to the room, Sorab was lying on the bed, his eyes closed. I couldn't tell if he was asleep. I sat on my bed and grimaced with pain. I swallowed some painkillers and wondered how long it would be before I'd be able to eat solid food. And I wondered what I'd do with the wounded little boy lying on the bed. Though a part of me already knew. When I woke, the slice of sky peeking through the hotel curtains was the purple of twilight. The sheets were soaked and my head pounded. I looked at Sorab's bed and my heart gave a sick lurch. It was empty. I called his name. Nothing. He was gone. I found the hotel manager reading a newspaper behind the Formica desktop. Ah, the boys like to run around, he sighed. But we're not from here. I'm afraid he might get lost. Then you should have kept an eye on him, mister. I stood at the counter trying not to scream. Have you any idea where he might have wandered? The mask, I said, remembering the way Sarab had strained out of the car window when we'd driven past. I found him on a patch of grass a hundred yards from the mask. I sat beside him. We listened to the call to prayer. Watch the buildings, hundreds of lights coming on. It sparkled like a diamond in the dark. It lit up the sky. Sorab's face. Father took me to Mazar-i Sharif when I was little, he said. We went to the Blue Mosque. I remember there were so many pigeons outside, and they weren't afraid of people. They came right up to us, and I fed them with bits of naan. That was fun. You must miss your parents very much, I said, wondering if he'd seen the Taliban drag them into the street. I hoped he hadn't. Do you miss your parents? I never met my mother, but I miss my father a lot. Do you remember what he looked like? I nodded. I remember what he smelled like too. I am starting to forget their faces. Is that bad? I felt in the pocket of my coat, found the photo of Hassan and Sorab. Here! He brought it to within an inch of his face. I thought he might cry, but he just traced his thumb over its surface. I thought of a line I'd read somewhere. There are lots of children in Afghanistan, but little childhood. Can I ask you something, Amiraha? Of course. Will God put me in hell for what I did to that man? Nay, of course not. I wanted to hold him, tell him that the world had been unkind to him, not the other way round, but when I reached for him, he flinched. I pulled back, his face strained to stay composed. Father used to say, it is wrong to hurt even bad people, because they don't know any better. And because bad people sometimes become good. Not always, Sarab. The man who hurt you tried to hurt me once when I was your age. But your father saved me. Your father was very brave and he was always rescuing me from trouble. So one day the man hurt your father instead. In a very bad way. And I... I couldn't save your father the way he saved me. Sometimes bad people stay bad. And you have to stand up to them. What you did to that man is what I should have done all those years ago. Your father would be so proud of you. I miss my father and mother, but sometimes I'm glad they're not here anymore. I don't want them to see me. I'm so dirty and full of sin. Those men, they did things. You're not dirty, Sorab. You're not full of sin. I reached gently and pulled him to me. I won't hurt you, I promise. He resisted a little. 
then slackened. Finally, he rested his head on my chest and sobbed. As his pain soaked through my shirt, I knew that a kinship had taken root between us. I'd been looking for the right moment to ask the question that had been buzzing around in my head. I decided it was now, with the bright lights of the house of God shining on us. Would you like to come and live in America with me and my wife? He didn't answer. He just sobbed in my shirt, and I let him. For a week, neither of us mentioned what I had asked. Then one day, sitting in the park, Sorab pointed at the sky. I didn't know there were hawks in Islamabad, I said. Neither me, he replied. Do they have them where you live? I guess so. Can't say I've seen too many, though. I handed him a sandwich. Your father and I were brothers, I said. It just came out. I'd wanted to tell him for days. I didn't want to hide anything anymore. Half-brothers, really. We had the same father. Sorab stopped chewing. Father never said he had a brother. He didn't know. No one told either of us. I only just found out. But why did people hide it from father and you? Because he was a Hazara. I willed my eyes to stay on him. Yes. Did your father love you and my father equally? I pictured Baba in the hospital room, beaming as they removed the bandages from Hassan's lips. I think he loved us equally, but differently. Was he ashamed of my father? No. I think he was ashamed of himself. On the way back to the hotel, Sarah plagued me with questions about San Francisco. I smiled. Have you given any thought to what I asked you? It scares me. I know. But you'll learn English so fast. That's not what I mean. What if you get tired of me? What if your wife doesn't like me? I put my arm around him. I won't ever get tired of you, Sorab. You're my nephew, remember? And Soraya is a very kind woman. She's going to love you. I don't want to go to another orphanage. I won't ever let that happen. I promise you that. When Sorab had gone to sleep, I phoned Soraya. She screamed when she heard my voice. She'd been sick with worry. I looked at my watch. I have 57 minutes left on this stupid calling card, and I have so much to tell you. Then I did what I hadn't done in 15 years of marriage. I told my wife everything. By the time I'd finished, she was weeping. But one thing she made clear was that she loved me, and she wanted me to bring Sorab home. At the American Embassy, I explained that I had gone into Afghanistan to bring back my half-brother's son. I had found the boy in squalid conditions in an orphanage, and I had brought him to Pakistan. You're the boy's half-uncle? the official asked. Yes. Know anyone who can attest to that? Yes, but I don't know where he is. We were in trouble, and I knew it. Even if we assume what you've told me is true, the boy isn't legally an orphan. His parents were executed in the street, I said. You have death certificates? I was incredulous. This is Afghanistan we're talking about. Most people don't even have birth certificates. His eyes didn't so much as blink. If you want to help, send money to a reputable relief organization. Volunteer at a refugee camp. But at this point in time, we strongly discourage U.S. citizens from attempting to adopt Afghan children. I'm not giving up. I said. Then you need a good immigration lawyer. Omar Faisal had dimpled cheeks and an affable smile. I told him everything. Well, Amir, you got a tough battle ahead of you. One I can win? At the risk of sounding like an embassy official, it's not likely. Even if it's clear that the child has no surviving parents, the INS think it's good adoption practice to place him with someone in his own country. And as far as Afghanistan goes, 
Sharia law doesn't recognize adoption. The only option I can see, and it's a long shot, is to relinquish him to an orphanage here. Then file something called an orphan petition. I promised Sorab I wouldn't send him back to an orphanage. It may be your only shot. Back at the hotel, I sat beside Sorab. You promised me you'd never put me in one of those places, Amiraha. His voice was breaking, tears pooling in his eyes. This is different. It will be here in Islamabad, and I'd visit you all the time until we can get you out and take you to America. They'll hurt me. No one's gonna hurt you ever again. I wiped the tears streaking down his cheeks, wrapped my arms around his shaky little body. It'll be all right. You'll see. Please, promise, won't you, Amir? Please promise. How could I promise? I held him against me and rocked back and forth until his breathing slowed and he fell asleep. I carried him to his bed, then lay on my own, looking out at the purple sky. The phone jolted me from sleep. Call from America. The bathroom door was open. Sorab was taking his nightly bath. A couple of clicks, and then Soraya. I told her about my disastrous day. Well, you can forget about that. I have spoken to a guy who has contacts in the INS. Apparently, if we get Sorab into the country, it is almost certain we can get him a humanitarian visa. I knocked on the bathroom door. Sorab, great news! We don't have to put you in an orphanage, Sorab. I pushed the door open. Suddenly, I was on my knees, screaming, screaming until I thought my chest would explode. They said I was still screaming when the ambulance arrived. I see them wheel him through a set of double doors. Two men wearing surgical caps huddle over the trolley. A pair of small, bloody feet poke out from under the sheet. I close my eyes, and my nostrils fill with the smell of the corridor. I open them again, and I know what I have to do. I grab a sheet from a pile of folded linen. I throw my makeshift prayer rug on the floor and get on my knees. I haven't prayed for over fifteen years. I've long forgotten the words, but it doesn't matter. I'll utter those few words I still remember. I see now that Baba was wrong. There is a God. I see him here, in the eyes of the people in this corridor of desperation. This is where those who have lost God will find him, not in the white mosque with its bright diamond lights and towering minarets. There is a God. There has to be. I will pray that He forgives that I have neglected Him all these years. Forgive that I have betrayed, lied. And sinned only to turn to him now in my hour of need. I pray that he is as merciful, benevolent, and gracious as his book says he is. I hear a whimpering, and I realize it's mine. My lips are salty, with the tears trickling down my face. I pray that my sins haven't caught up with me, the way I had always feared they would. Someone's tapping me on the shoulder. There's a man kneeling beside me, wearing a cap and a surgical mask. I don't think I can bear to hear what he's come to tell me. Twice they had to revive him. He'd cut himself so deep, they would have lost him if his heart hadn't been young and strong. He is alive. How are you? I asked. He didn't answer. He was looking through the window of the intensive care unit at the sandbox in the hospital garden. His eyes were vacant, the way I found them when I pulled him out of the bathtub. I reached into the paper bag between my feet and I took out the copy of the Shanama I'd bought at a Persian bookstore. I used to read this to your father when we were children. We'd go up the hill by our house and sit under the pomegranate tree. 
His favorite was the story of Rustam and Sorab. That's how you got your name. I know you know that. I paused, feeling like an idiot. Anyway, he said in his letter that it was your favorite too. Shall I read to you? Sorab covered his eyes with his arm. I am so tired. Tired of everything. What can I do, Sorab? I want my old life back. I want father and mother. I want to play with Rahim Khan in the garden. I didn't know what to say, where to look. I wish you had left me in the water. Oh, Sorab. I leaned forward to touch his shoulder, and he flinched. I dropped my hand, remembering ruefully how in the days before I'd broken my promise to him. He had finally become at ease with my touch. Sorab, I can give you your old life back. I wish to God I could. But I can take you with me. You have a visa to go to America to live with me and my wife. It's true. I promise. He sighed. I wished I hadn't said those last two words. You know, I've done a lot of things I regret in my life. And maybe none more than going back on the promise I made you. But that will never happen again. I am so profoundly sorry. I ask for your forgiveness. Can you do that? Can you believe me? Will you come with me? Sarab rolled on his side and said quietly, I am so very tired. In the end, he never accepted my offer. What I took as a yes was in actuality more of a quiet surrender by one too weary to decide and far too tired to believe. And so it was that about a week later I brought Hassan's son from Afghanistan to America. If someone were to ask me today whether the story of Hassan, Sorab and me ends with happiness, I wouldn't know what to say. We arrived home about seven months ago. Saraya picked us up at the airport. I'd never been away from her for so long, and when I smelled apples in her hair, I realized how much I had missed her. After she knelt to eye level with Sorab, she took his hand and smiled at him. Sorab shifted on his feet and looked away. Saraya had turned the study upstairs into a bedroom. She led Sorab in and he sat on the edge of the bed. The sheet showed brightly colored kites flying in indigo blue sky. At the foot of the bed was a wicker basket stuffed with toys and books. Sorab looked at it impassively. Soraya asked if he liked his room. He lowered his head, said nothing. Then he simply laid his head on the pillow, and less than five minutes later he was asleep. Sarab didn't so much live with us as occupy space, and precious little of it. Sometimes at the market or in the park, I notice how other people hardly seem to see him. He moved as if not to stir the air around him. Mostly, he slept. Sarab's silence was hard on Soraya. Over the long distance line to Pakistan, she told me about the things she was planning for him. Swimming classes, soccer. Now she'd walk past his room and catch a glimpse of books sitting unopened, jigsaw puzzles unmade. While Sarab was silent, the world was not. One Tuesday morning, the Twin Towers came crumbling down, and overnight the world changed. Soon after the attacks, America bombed Afghanistan. The Northern Alliance moved in, and the Taliban scurried like rats into the caves. Suddenly people were standing in grocery stores talking about the cities of my childhood. Kandahar, Herat, Mazari Sharif. Surab sleepwalked through it all. Then four days ago, on a cool rainy weekend in March, a small wondrous thing happened. I took Saraya and Surab to a gathering of Afghans at the park. The previous week had been the Afghan New Year. We arrived around noon. Someone was already frying balani, 
Steam rose from teacups. A scratchy old Ahmed Zahir song was blaring from a cassette player. It had been raining, and we rushed across the soggy grass into the shelter of a makeshift tent. Sarab only stayed under the canopy for a moment and then stepped back into the rain, hands stuffed in the pockets of his raincoat, his hair plastered against his scalp. No one seemed to notice. With time, the queries about our adopted and decidedly eccentric little boy had mercifully eased. People stopped asking why he never spoke, why he didn't play with the other kids. I shook hands with Kabir, a silver-haired man who introduced me to a dozen others, who'd all known Baba. In one way or another, he touched all their lives. They said I was lucky to have had such a great man for a father. Someone lightened a barbecue, and a smell of lamb kebab flooded my senses. Soraya pulled on my sleeve. Amir, look! She was pointing in the air. A half dozen kites were flying high against the gray sky. A man was selling them from a stand nearby. I walked over and pointed to a yellow one. He handed me the kite and a wooden spool of glass tar. I tested the string the way Hassan and I used to, by holding it between my thumb and forefinger. The seller smiled. I took the kite to where Sarab was standing. Do you like it? I asked, holding it up by the end of the crossbar. His eyes shifted from the sky to me, to the kite, then back. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Saraya watching us from the tent, hands tensely dug in her armpits. I wet my index finger and held it up. I remember the way your father checked the wind was to kick up the dust with his sandal, see which way the wind blew it. He knew a lot of little tricks like that. Sorab wiped a raindrop from his earlobe, shifted on his feet. Did I ever tell you your father was the best kite runner in all of Kabul? How jealous he made the neighborhood kids? He'd run kites and never look up at the sky and people used to say he was chasing the kite shadow. But they didn't know him, like I did. Your father wasn't chasing shadows, he just knew. Another half dozen kites had taken flight. People had started to gather in clumps, teacups in hands, eyes glued to the sky. Do you want to help me fly it? Sarab's gaze bounced from the kite to me. Okay, I shrugged. Looks like I'll have to fly it solo. I balanced the spool in my left hand and fed about three feet of tar. The yellow kite dangled at the end of it, just above the wet grass. Last chance. All right, here I go. I took off, running, the hand clutching the kite end of the string held high above my head. I let the spool roll in my left hand. The kite was lifting behind me now, lifting and wheeling, I ran harder, then stopped and turned. High above, my kite was tilting side to side, making that old flapping sound I always associated with winter mornings in Kabul. I hadn't flown a kite for a quarter of a century, but suddenly I was twelve again, and all the old instincts came rushing back. I felt a presence next to me and looked down. It was Sorab, hands dug deep in the pockets of his raincoat. He'd followed me. Do you want to try? I asked. He said nothing. But when I held the string out for him, his hand lifted from his pocket, hesitated, took the string. We stood quietly, side by side, necks bent up. Then I saw we had company. A green kite was closing in. I traced the string to a kid standing about thirty yards from us. He saw me looking and waved. I smiled. Okay, let's teach him a lesson. The glassy vacant look in Sarab's eyes was gone. His gaze flitted between our kite and the green one. His eyes suddenly alive. I wondered when I'd forgotten that despite everything, he was still just a child. The green kite was making its move. Let's wait, I said. Let him get a little closer. The kite dipped twice and crept towards us, suddenly rising above us unaware of the trap I'd set. 
Watch, Sorab. I'm going to show you one of your father's favorite tricks. Next to me, Sorab gripped the spool. And just for a moment, I saw the calloused hands of a hairlip boy. The park shimmered with snow, so fresh, so dazzling white, it burnt my eyes. I smelled dried mulberries, sour oranges. The green kite hovered directly above us, held position, then shot down. Here he comes. I did it perfectly. After all these years, the old lift and dive trap, I loosened my grip and tugged on the string, dipping and dodging the green kite. A series of quick sidearm jerks and our kite shot up counterclockwise in a half circle. Suddenly I was on top. The green kite was scrambling now, panic-stricken, but it was too late. I pulled hard and our kite plummeted. I could almost feel our string sawing his, almost heard the snap. Then just like that, the green kite was spinning and wheeling out of control. Behind us, people cheered. The last time I'd felt a rush like this was that day in the winter of 1975 when I spotted Baba on our rooftop, clapping, beaming. I looked down at Surab. One corner of his mouth had curled up. A smile. Lopsided, but there. Behind us, a melee of screaming kite runners was chasing the loose kite. I blinked, and the smile had gone. But it had been there. I'd seen it. Do you want me to run that kite for you? He swallowed. I thought I saw him nod. For you, a thousand times over, I heard myself say. Then I turned and ran. It was only a smile, nothing more. It didn't make everything all right. It was just a leaf in the woods, shaking in the wake of a startled bird's flight. But I'll take it, with open arms. Because when spring comes, it melts the snow one flake at a time. And maybe... I just witnessed the first flake melting. I ran, a grown man, running with a swarm of screaming children, but I didn't care. I ran with the wind blowing in my face and a smile as wide as the valley of Panchere on my lips. I ran.